Mons, yet another rehearsal. One. A bird's eye view of 50 years of dead. See scrolls research. 1947 to 1967. News of an extraordinary discovery of seven ancient Hebrew and Aramaic manuscripts began to spread in 1948 from Israeli and American sources. To the original chants find by a young Bedouin shepherd, Muhammad Eddib, occurred during the last months of the British Mandate in Palestine in the spring or summer of 1947, unless it was slightly earlier in the winter of 1946.3 in 1949, the cave where the scrolls lay hidden was identified, thanks to the efforts of a bored Belgian army officer of the United Nations Armistice Observer Corps, Captain Philippe Lippens, assisted by a unit of Jordan's Arab Legion, commanded by Major General Lash. It was investigated by G. Lancaster Harding the English director of the Department of Antiquities of Jordan, and the French Dominican archaeologist and biblical scholar, Father Roland de Vos. They retrieved hundreds of leather fragments, some large but most of them minute, in addition to the seven scrolls found in the same cave. Three of the rolls, an incomplete Isaiah manuscript, a scroll of hymns and one describing the War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness were purchased in 1947 by the Hebrew University's professor of Jewish archaeology, E. L. Sukhanik, who proceeded at full speed towards their publication. The other four were entrusted for study and eventual publication by their owner, the Arab Metropolitan. Archbishop March Athanasius, head of the Syrian Orthodox Monastery of St. Mark in Jerusalem, to the resident staff of the American School for Oriental Research in Jerusalem, Miller Burroughs, W. H. Brownlee and J. C. Trevor. These three took charge of a complete Isaiah manuscript, the commentary on Habakkuk and the Manual of Discipline, later renamed the Community Rule. Finally, after the splitting of British Mandatory Palestine into Israel and Jordan, at the École Biblique et Archéologique Française in Jordanian Jerusalem two young researchers, the Frenchman Dominique Barthélemy and the Pole Joseph Tadeus Millik, were commissioned by De Vos and Harding in late 1951 to edit the fragments collected in Cave I. Between 1951 and 1956, ten further caves were discovered, most of them by Bedouin in the first instance. Two yielded substantial quantities of material. Thousands and thousands of fragments were found in Cave 4 and several scrolls, including the longest, the Temple. Scroll, were retrieved from Cave 2. The previously neglected ruins of a settlement in the proximity of the caves were also excavated by Harding and Devors, and the view soon prevailed that the texts the caves and the Qumran site were interconnected, and that consequently the study of the script and contents of the manuscripts should be accompanied by archaeological research. Progress was surprisingly quick despite the fact that in those halcyon days, apart from the small Nash papyrus, containing the Ten Commandments, found in Egypt and now in the Cambridge University Library, no Hebrew documents dating to late antiquity were extant to provide terms of comparison. In 1948 and 1949, Sukhanik published in Hebrew two preliminary surveys entitled Hidden Scrolls from the Judean Desert, and concluded that the religious community involved was the ascetic sect of the Essens, well known from the 1st century CE writings of Philo, Josephus and Pliny the Elder. A thesis worked out in great detail from 1951 onwards by André Dupont Soma in Paris. For the first Qumran scrolls to reach the public, and the archaeological setting in which they were discovered, echoed three striking Essene characteristics. The community rule, a basic code of sectarian existence, reflects Essene common ownership and celibate life. 
while the geographical location of Qumran tallies with Pliny's. Essene settlement on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea, south of Jericho. The principal novelty provided by the manuscripts consists of cryptic allusions to the historical origins of the community, launched by a priest called the Teacher of Righteousness, who was persecuted by a Jewish ruler, designated as the Wicked Priest. The teacher and his followers were compelled to withdraw into the desert, where they awaited the impending manifestation of God's triumph over evil and darkness in the end of days, which had already begun. An almost unanimous agreement soon emerged, dating the discovery, on the basis of paleography and archaeology, to the last centuries of the Second Temple, i.e. 2nd century BCE to 1st century CE. For a short while there was controversy between Devors, who decreed that the pottery and all the finds belonged to the Hellenistic era, i.e. pre-63 BCE, and Dupontes Emma, who argued for an early Roman, post-63, date. But the finding of further caves and the excavation of the ruins of Qumran brought about on the 4th of April, 1952, Devors's dramatic retraction before the French Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres. His revised archaeological synthesis, presented in the 1959 Schweitzer Lectures of the British Academy, while admittedly incomplete, is still the best comprehensive statement available today. 5. A third point of early consensus concerns the chronology of the events alluded to in the Qumran writings, especially the biblical commentaries published in the 1950s and the Damascus document. The so-called Maccabean theory, placing the conflict between the teacher of righteousness and the politico-religious Jewish leadership of the day in the time of the Maccabean high priest or high priests Jonathan and forward slash or Simon was first formulated in my 1952 doctoral dissertation, published in 1953-6 and was soon to be adopted with variations in detail by such leading specialists as J.T. Millick, F.M. Cross and R. Devors.7 As long as the editorial task consisted only of publishing the seven scrolls from Cave I, work was advancing remarkably fast. Miller Burroughs and his colleagues published their three manuscripts in 1950 and 1951.8 Sukhanik's three texts appeared in a posthumous volume in 1954-5.9 in the interest of speed, these editors generously abstained from translating and interpreting the texts, and were content with releasing the photographs and their transcription. The best preserved sections of the Aramaic Genesis Apocryphon followed closely in 1956.10 Even the fragments from Cave I, handled with alacrity and Loving Care by D. Barthelemy and J. T. Millick, appeared in 1955.11 The Secrecy Rule of Later Years restricting access to unpublished texts to a small team of editors appointed by Devors, had not yet been applied. On my first visit to Jerusalem in 1952, I was allowed to examine the fragments of the rule of the congregation, 1 QSAT, as may be seen from the inclusion in the final edition of a reading suggested by me to the editors. The scroll fragments, partly found by the archaeologists, but mostly purchased from the Arabs, who nine times out of ten outwitted their professional rivals, were cleaned, sorted out and displayed in the so-called scrollery in the Rockefeller Museum, later renamed the Palestine Archaeological Museum, to become after 1967 once more the Rockefeller Museum. If the mass of material disgorged by Cave 4 had not upset the original arrangements, the scandalous delays in publishing in later years need never have happened. To deal with Cave 4, Father Devors improvised, in 1953 and 1954, a team of seven on the whole young and untried scholars. Bartholomew opted out, and the brilliant but unpredictable Abbey J.T. Millick, 
who later left the Roman Catholic priesthood, became the pillar of the new group. He was joined by the French Abbe Jean Starkey, and two Americans, Monsignor Patrick Scahan and Frank Moore Cross. John Marco Allegro and John Strugnell were recruited from Britain, and from Germany, Claus Hanno Hunzinger, who soon resigned and was replaced later by the French Abbe Maurice Baylet. It should have been evident to anyone with a modicum of good sense that a group of seven editors, of whom only two, Starkey and Scahan, had already established a scholarly reputation, was insufficient to perform such an enormous task on any level, let alone to produce the kind of last word edition de Vos appears to have contemplated. The second serious error committed by de Vos was that he wholly relied on his personal, quasi-patriarchal authority. Instead of setting up from the start a supervisory body empowered, if necessary, to sack those members of the team who might fail to fulfill their obligations promptly and to everyone's satisfaction. Yet before depicting the chaos characterizing the publishing process in the 1970s and 1980s, in fairness it should be stressed that, during the first decade or so, the industry of the group could not seriously be faulted. Judging from the completion around 1060 of a primitive concordance, recorded on handwritten index cards, of all the words appearing in the fragments found in caves 2 to 10, it is clear that at an early date most of the texts had been identified and deciphered. The many criticisms advanced in subsequent years, focusing on these scholars' refusal to put their valuable findings into the public domain, should not prevent one from acknowledging that this original achievement, in which J.T. Millick had the lion's share, deserves unrestricted admiration. After the publication of the Cave I Fragments in 1955, the contents of the eight minor caves, 2-3, 5-10, were released in a single volume in 1963.12 in 1965 J. A. Sanders, an American scholar who was not part of the original team, edited the Psalms scroll, found in Cave 2 in 1956.13 Finally, with its typescript completed and dispatched to the printers a year before the fatal date of 1967, the first poorly edited Volume of Cave 4 Fragments saw the light of day in 1968.14 to 1967-1990 With the occupation of East Jerusalem in the Six-Day War, all the scroll fragments housed in the Palestine Archaeological Museum came under the control of the Israel Department of Antiquities. Only the copper scroll and a few other fragments exhibited in Oman remained in Jordanian hands. The temple scroll, which until then had been held by a dealer in Bethlehem 15 was quickly retrieved with the help of army intelligence and acquired by the State of Israel. Eugail Yardin, Deputy Prime Minister of Israel in the 1970s, mixing politics with scholarship managed to complete a magisterial three-volume publication by 1977.16. A gentlemanly gesture on the part of the Israelis, who decided not to interfere with divorce, left him and his scattered troop in charge of the Cave 4 texts.17 As for the unpublished manuscripts from Cave 2, they were handled by Dutch and American academics.18. Father de Vos, whose anti-Israeli sentiments were no secret, quietly withdrew to his tent and remained inactive until his death in 1971. Another French Dominican, Pierre Benoit, succeeded him as it were by natural selection in the editorial chair in 1972. The Israeli archaeological establishment, still aloof, conferred its blessing on him. By then, at my instigation, C. H. Roberts, secretary to the delegates, i.e. chief executive of Oxford University Press, decided to demand speedier publication, 
but Ben Watt's ineffectual rallying call either elicited no response from his men, or produced promises which were never honored. 19 In a lecture delivered in 1977, I coined the phrase which was thereafter often repeated that the greatest Hebrew manuscript discovery was fast becoming the academic scandal par excellence of the 20th century. 20. One may ask how and why, after such an apparently propitious beginning, a group of scholars, most of whom were gifted, had turned the editorial work on the scrolls into such a lamentable story. In my opinion, the academic scandal of the century resulted from a concatenation of causes. Lack of organization and unfortunate choice of collaborators can be blamed on divorce. For the majority of the team members who had other jobs to cope with, the overlong part-time effort caused their original enthusiasm to fade and vanish. J.T. Millick, the most productive of them until the mid-70s, appears to have been disenchanted by the cool reception of his highly speculative thesis contained in his edition of the books of Enoch Aramaic Fragments of Qumran Cave for 1976. Academic imperialism was also a factor. It was easier to hold that these texts belong to us, not to you, than to admit that the procrastinating editors had undertaken more than they could deliver. Add to this the initial unwillingness of the Israelis to shoulder their responsibilities, and, as will be shown, their lack of foresight and repeated misjudgments before, finally, in the late 1980s they began to take an active part in matters of editorial policy. Need I say more? The inevitable began to happen, in 1980 Patrick Scahan died, followed by Jean Starkey in 1986, both without publishing their assignments. Eugene Ulrich and Emile Pietsch became their heirs, while F. M. Cross and J. Strugnell distributed portions of their texts to serve as dissertation topics for doctoral students at Harvard University. The responsible for some good, and occasionally excellent, monographs, this unfortunate practice further delayed progress as thesis writers like to keep their cards close to their chests until their PhDs are in the bag. In 1986, a year before his death, Pierre Benoit resigned as editor-in-chief and the depleted international team elected as his successor the talented but tardy John Strugnell, who in 33 years failed to produce a single volume of text. In 1987, at a public session of a scrolls symposium held in London, I urged him to publish at once the photographic plates, while he and his acolytes carried on with their work at their customary snail pace. This request was met with a one-syllable negative answer. To the surprise of many, the Israel Antiquities Authority, or IAA, acquiesced in Strugnell's appointment. His grandiose schemes never bore fruit. In 1990, after a compromising interview given by him to an Israeli newspaper, in which he was reported as having made disparaging remarks not only about Israelis, but also about the Jewish religion, he called it horrible, his fellow editors persuaded him to tender his resignation. It was accepted by the IAA on health grounds. Belatedly even the Israelis saw the light, AND de facto terminated the 37-year-old and ultimately disastrous reign of the international team. 3 1990 to 2003 After John Strugnell's withdrawal, the very capable Emmanuel Toth, professor of biblical studies at the Hebrew University, was appointed chief editor, the first Jew and the first Israeli to head the Qumran publication project. He began his activities auspiciously by redistributing the unpublished texts among freshly recruited collaborators. The new editorial team, of which I became a member in 1991, consists of some 60 scholars compared to the original seven. Unfortunately, Toph did not feel free to cancel the secrecy rule, introduced and strictly enforced by Devors and his successors, 
prohibiting access to unpublished texts to all but a few chosen editors. However, the protective dam erected around the fragments by the international team collapsed in the autumn of 1991 under the growing pressure of public opinion, mobilized in particular by Herschel Shanks, in the columns of the widely read Biblical Archaeology Review, Ba. The first landmark event leading towards full freedom was the publication in early September by Ba's parent body, the Biblical Archaeology Society, of 17 Cave 4 manuscripts reconstructed with the help of a computer by Benzirin Wachoda and Martin Abeg 21 from the preliminary concordance, alluded to earlier, which was privately issued in 25 copies, in theory only for the use of the official editors by John Strugnell in 1988.22 Later in the same month out of the blue came the announcement by William Amoft that the Huntington Library of San Marino, California, a renowned research institution, would bring to an end the 40-year-old closed shop by opening its complete photographic archive of the Qumran. Scrolls to all qualified scholars.23 the IAA and the official editors attempted to resist but, by the end of October, under pressure from the Nasset, Israel's parliament, they were all forced to recognize that the battle was lost and all restrictions had to be lifted. Almost at once, the scroll photograph archives at the Oxford Center for Postgraduate Hebrew Studies and at the Ancient Biblical Manuscript Center at Claremont previously legally compelled to restrict access only to persons approved by Jerusalem, were also thrown open to all competent research scholars. Moreover, in November 1991 the Biblical Archaeology Society published a two-volume photographic edition of the bulk of the Qumran fragments compiled by Robert Eisenman and James Robinson.24 How the two Californian professors obtained the material remains unclear. This new policy has had an essentially beneficial effect on Qumran studies. Since vested interests are no longer protected, the rate of publication has noticeably accelerated and from 1992 learned periodicals have been flooded with short or not so short papers by scholars claiming fresh insights. Free competition has expedited the official edition itself. The first Cave 4 volume of biblical texts, announced as imminent by Father Ben Watt in 1983, actually appeared past the 1992 date on the cover page, on 4 March 1993.25 scholarship and the general public were to become the beneficiaries of the new era of liberty. Only the procrastinators and the selfish stood to lose. By 1996, thanks to the highly efficient stewardship of the editor-in-chief, Emmanuel Toff, four further volumes have been published and another four are in the pipeline. Compared with the output of the previous regime, this is an admirable change indeed. At the time of the revision of this book, 36 out of the 39 volumes of discoveries in the Judean desert, DJD, have appeared, 28 of them since the watershed year of the Scrolls Revolution in 1991. The present state of Dead Sea Scrolls Studies between 1947 and 1956, the eleven Qumran caves yielded a dozen scrolls written on leather and one embossed on copper. To these we have to add fragments on papyrus or leather, the precise number of which is unknown but probably in the order of six figures. About 800 original documents are fully or partly represented. The Cave 4 list alone contains 575 titles 26 though it seems that some 20 documents, 4Q342-61, probably originating from non-Qumran Judean desert locations were mistakenly catalogued as 4Q material. 
Most scrolls are written in Hebrew, a smaller portion in Aramaic and only a few attest the ancient Greek or Septuagint version of the Bible.27 Among the texts previously known, all the books of the Hebrew scriptures are extant at least in fragments save Esther the absence of which may be purely accidental.28 Even Daniel, the most recent work to enter the Palestinian canon in the mid-2nd century BCE, is attested to by eight manuscripts.29 There are also remains of Aramaic and Greek scriptural translations. Furthermore, the caves have yielded some of the Apocrypha, i.e. religious works missing from the Hebrew scriptures but included in the Septuagint the Bible of Greek-speaking Jews. Caves 4 and 11 revealed the book of Tobit in Aramaic and in Hebrew, Psalm Cli, described in the Greek version as a supernumerary psalm, and the wisdom of Jesus ben Syrah or Ecclesiasticus in Hebrew. Part of the latter, chapters Xxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx
they could make use also of manuscripts from Mazada, 1st century CE, as well as from the Murabarat and other Judean desert caves yielding 1st and 2nd century CE Jewish writings. A rather too rigid, but useful, comprehensive system was quickly devised by F. M. Cross.31 While admittedly controversial if unsupported either by actual dates in the manuscripts themselves, a phenomenon, alas, unknown at Qumran, or by external criteria, these paleographical conclusions were to receive a twofold boost from archaeology and radiocarbon dating. The archaeological thesis, based in Ter on the study of pottery and coins, was formulated by Udavors. Compare note 5 on P4. He assigned the occupation of Qumran to the period between the second half of the 2nd century BCE and the first war between Jews and Romans, 66 to 70 CE. Radiocarbon tests were first applied to the cloth wrapping of one of the scrolls as early as 1951. The date suggested was 33 CE but one had to reckon with a 10% margin of error each way.32 However, with the improved techniques of the 1990s, eight Qumran manuscripts were subjected to accelerator mass spectrometry or MS6 of them were found to be definitely pre-Christian, and only two straddled over the 1st century BCE forward slash 1st century CE dividing line.33 Most importantly, with a single exception, the testament of Kahat being shown to be about 300 years earlier than expected, the radiocarbon dates confirm in substance those proposed by the paleographers. Unfortunately, the manuscripts tested in 1990 did not include historically sensitive texts. But in 1994 the IAA invited the Arizona AMS Laboratory at the University of Arizona. Tucson to analyze 18 texts and two linen fragments. Thirteen of the manuscripts came definitely from Qumran and one of these had already been carbon. Dated in Zurich. Three texts were date-bearing. The general conclusion is as follows, measurements on samples of known ages are in good agreement with those known ages. Ages determined from 14 C measurements on the remainder of the Dead Sea Scroll samples are in reasonable agreement with paleographic estimates of such ages, in the case where those estimates are available 34 on the whole, the results of this second radiocarbon analysis are somewhat disappointing in that, while the dates arrived at accommodate the paleographic proposals. The margin of error is considerably greater than that appearing in the 1990s Zurich tests. Nevertheless, Arizona has scored on one highly significant point, the Habakkuk commentary, chief source of the history of the Qumran sect, is definitely put in the pre-Christian era between 120 and 5 BCE. In consequence, Fringe scholars who see in this writing allusions to events described in the New Testament will find they have a problem on their hands. In sum, the general scholarly view today places the Qumran scrolls roughly between 200 BCE and 70 CE, with a small portion of the texts possibly stretching back to the 3rd century BCE, and the bulk of the extant material dating to the 1st century BCE, i.e. late Hasmonean or early Herodian in the jargon of the paleographers. B.